So many of the important moments in life we often accompany with a meal. If you think about it, a wedding would seem incomplete if it did not have a lavish reception that followed immediately afterwards. We just expect to have some sort of meal to celebrate that solemn occasion. Or even a funeral luncheon itself, that we often have the funeral, we celebrate that liturgy, we entrust the soul to God, but then we also expect to commune, to go and to also have a meal together to support one another. Or even in some of the other moments of life, perhaps a graduation, that it just wouldn't feel right if we just simply left it at a diploma, but we also want a gathering of friends and family to come together and to dine together. That it's just so important, it's part and parcel of what we do, to have a meal in a to whatever the important moment is. And we often might think of the Mass in similar terms, that we might think about it in terms of that meal, and we think about coming to the table of plenty, and so many different titles that have been given to it. And certainly we are fed at this table, that is important. But is there an important moment? Is there something else that the Lord wants us to focus on even before we approach the banquet of the Lord? We started off this morning with a reading from the book of Exodus, and Moses is speaking to the people on behalf of the Lord, and they are starting to assent to the Lord and to his law and commands. So they're saying, whatever the Lord asks, we will do. And we have to understand the context to this, because we're following after the events that have led to them being freed from captivity to the Egyptians. And so they are grateful to the Lord. They've seen the way that he has blessed them, and he has bestowed his favor upon them in so many different ways, in so many different respects. They've seen his marvelous work. And so they see that, and the Lord starts to ask them to enter into relationship and to even start to surrender something to him on that behalf, that he's asking them to enter into a covenant, a sort of secret exchange, a sort of contract that would tell that if you do these things, if you surrender over these things, the Lord will give you these things. And so if they follow the law of the Lord, if they follow his commands, then they will enjoy his blessing and his favor. And they hear that and they say, what the Lord asked, we will do. You see that they are just elated that the Lord is giving them blessing and giving them favor. And so then he goes about that Moses solemnizes this with the blood of a lamb, that this blood of sacrifice is poured out upon the altar, but then also sprinkled upon all the people as a sign and a symbol of this covenant. It's telling about this agreement between God and his people so that they do not forget that the Lord who has led them through and led them out of captivity to Egypt has, will continue to give them his favor and will bestow many blessings upon them if they agree to his command. And indeed, they do. But we hear this joyous occasion and solemn proclamation, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. That is exactly what the Israelites are doing, that they are taking this blood of sacrifice and they are sprinkling it out, that they are solemnizing that covenant, recognizing that they have been, they're giving things over to the Lord so that they may receive blessing of his benefit and of his grace. We continue on to the letter to the Hebrews, and this actually dovetails quite nicely with the first reading, because it tells us not just of sacrifice, but of the sacrifice, not just of a sort of blood poured out from a lamb or a calf, but the blood that is poured out from the Lamb of God, that is Christ himself. And why does this matter? Well, the letter to the Hebrews, it tells us that when we speak of Jesus, we speak about the great high priest. The high priest was the one that in temple worship times that would go into the temple area, would offer sacrifice on behalf of the people so that their sins would be forgiven. And indeed, Jesus is that high priest. But not just in, he's not just a high priest, he's the high priest. He's the one that offers the sacrifice, and not just any sacrifice, because the problem with the sacrifices of old, all of the sacrifices of the many multitudes of animals, was that they were done for a time, but then they needed to be done again. And indeed, that was the case, that it needed to be done year after year after year, and occasion after occasion. But with the Lord, there is only one sacrifice. He is the perfect sacrifice. Whenever he offers up his body, he pours out his blood on the cross. There is only one sacrifice that is ever needed because he is the spotless lamb. He is the perfect one. He is the one who offers himself up for the, the salvation of the entire world. And so why is this done? This is done so that we may have life. 
then we may have it abundantly. That ultimately, if one chooses to live in the blood of Christ and live in communion with that, then they can surely trust in the providence of the Lord that will lead them to the halls of heaven towards their eternal reward, which is eternal life. Then we move on to the gospel, and we hear about this moment of Passover, that Jesus is getting ready to celebrate the Last Supper with his disciples. And notice this detail that might seem like it's kind of inconsequential, but it actually fulfills and fills out what Jesus is doing. Because the Passover was a celebration and a sacrifice that had to be done time and time again. That it was a meal that ultimately had to be repeated. But Jesus is doing something different. Because he's the Passover lamb. He's the one that sacrifices once and for all. That he does, that this does not need to be repeated. That he does not need to come back and die again and again. But it is represented to us to punctuate our time and our reality. And so he dies. He offers up his body and his blood once and for all upon the cross. But nonetheless, we enter into the Last Supper because they receive that. That the disciples that are there, they are partaking of the Lord's body and his blood under the simple and humble appearances of bread and of that cup. But nonetheless, the Lord says, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant that will be poured out for many. Do this in memory of me. That same element of covenant It's come back into light. And it's important because we should recognize that this element of covenant, it still exists in our time. That it's not just something that was of old, but it is actually something that is made new in Christ. But here's the difference. The sacrifices of animals are no longer with us. But rather, the sacrifice that's here is Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. That this is the sacrifice that ultimately wins us salvation. And this is the one that is offered once and for all for the salvation of all peoples, if they but choose to live in communion with their Lord and God. And that's a beautiful thing to realize, that the Lord is continuing a new covenant, that this covenant is the one where he offers us his body and his blood so that we may have life and have it abundantly and forever. And this is a powerful reality. But what does it challenge us to do, especially as we celebrate this feast of Corpus Christi, the feast of the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, first, we heard about the word covenant, and we need to recognize that there are always two parties involved in a covenant, and they are, equal, they are given something each in return. So the Lord is still offering us something, that he is offering us the body and blood of his son. But what this means is we offer that back, and we also have to continue to consecrate our life. But what does this mean for us? If the Lord has offered his body and blood, which he has, then this means we may have life and have it abundantly. And we need to hear this clearly. This means that in spite of whatever we've done, whatever wrong that we have had the misfortune of doing or falling to, no matter how far nor depraved that we think that we are, no matter how far we think that we are removed from the grace of God, the blood and the body of Christ It's sacrifice and it satisfies and atones for those things. So no matter how far we think we are from God, no matter how far we think we've fallen, the body and blood of Christ is enough. That it will satisfy and will bring us to eternal life still yet if we repent and give over to the Lord all of our sins and wrongdoing. But we should recognize that in this covenant and in this relationship, we cannot treat the body and blood of Christ as if it's just another meal or just another action, one amongst many. But rather, we need to recognize this is the most important thing we do. This is the source and summit, as the Catechism calls it, of our faith. It does not mince words, but it says, this is why we are here. Jesus offers us his body and his blood so that we may have life and enjoy it forever. But here's the thing that whenever we're offered that gift, whenever we are receiving this sacrifice, whenever the Lord pours out his blood and gives over his body so that there might be satisfaction for the debt that is sin, then we have to respond. But what does that response look like? Many of us are likely familiar with the bare basics, the rudimentary parts of our faith when we approach the Mass, that we need to do it each and every week, that we've got an obligation to attend Mass, and if we don't do it for whatever reason, unless it is some sort of serious issue with our health or something of that sort, then we should approach the Sacrament of Reconciliation before we approach communion again. 
that the Lord has given us that commandment, and that's certainly true. But what about the other things that we have to do? What about that simple fast that we are supposed to do before Mass for an hour, just simply removing from ourselves food and water so as to prepare our physical body for the reception of Holy Communion? But there's more. Because this is just, these are just the bare essentials. These are just the basics. What about the other ways that we need to prepare? One of the things that the Catechism teaches us quite clearly is that to receive communion, we need to remove from our hearts and our souls all sin, all weakness, all sign of wrongdoing, especially serious sin. Now, those serious sins, they are quite evident to us in the Ten Commandments, but whenever we have the misfortune of committing one of those, fulfilling all of the requirements to commit a serious sin, then we should approach reconciliation before we approach the Lord's table again to receive the Lord's body and His blood. And this is part of making our soul a worthy place and a worthy receptacle and vessel for our Lord and God, that we might truly receive the Lord that we've made room within our heart and our soul, as imperfect as it might be, to receive the Lord so that He can continue to fill us with life and life abundantly. And so we should prepare our heart and our soul that if there's any sort of serious sin, approach the sacrament of reconciliation, run for the doors of the rec- the. the, the Uh, confessional, because whenever we do that, we also continue to receive the Lord's grace and blessing. We enable ourselves to receive the Eucharist more fruitfully and more effectively. Don't be afraid of the sacrament of reconciliation. There is nothing that you, any of us have done that cannot be forgiven by God's grace in the sacrament of reconciliation. Run for the sacrament. It's there for us. It wants to restore us so that we can receive the Eucharist more fruitfully. And then maybe just a few of the other considerations we should have about the Eucharist as well. Whenever we approach the sacrifice of the Mass, do we just run in right before the opening procession? Or do we spend a few moments in prayer, maybe reading through the readings in the Gospel before Mass even begins, just taking a few moments of silence in the Lord's presence? Because now more than ever before, our lives are filled with so much noise and are so hectic. We need a few moments of repose, of reprieve, so that we can prepare ourselves to receive the Lord, to celebrate the mysteries, which we will just celebrate in just a few moments. Or maybe even after Mass, it's not a race and a competition with the priest to see who can get out the door faster. Rather, what about a time of thanksgiving? Just telling the Lord how grateful we are, that He forgives our sins, that He renews us, washes us, and makes us clean by His blood, and that He gives us the Eucharist so that we can receive from this table of plenty. We can receive this food of spiritual nourishment. We can receive Jesus Himself. We should be grateful and we should stop for just a few moments or even just a few minutes at the end of Mass to give thanks to God in Jesus' presence for the gift that we have received. But I dare say one of the possibly more important things we can do as well outside of Mass is that we bear testimony to the Eucharist and the difference that it makes. Because we can't just receive it as if we're indifferent to it or just out of mere obligation. Do we realize what the Eucharist does? It renews us. It brings us healing. It brings us fulfillment. And it brings us closer to our Lord and God. And this should fill us with joy. But how many times do we walk out the doors of the church and say, now on to reality? How many times do we walk out and say, now I have to get back to all the things that I have to do? What if the Eucharist infused itself into those things? What if we allowed the joy of the Eucharist to sustain us in our daily life? What if we allowed it to change every moment of our existence so that we're not only merely living this as one moment amongst many, but one moment that changes all the rest? What if we lived as if the Eucharist is going to make a difference? Because if we allow it that liberty, it will certainly change our entire life. But also, too, we need to realize it changes our very being and changes, and it should change, the way that we act. That very same mouth and tongue that receives the Eucharist, what is it speaking when it's outside the church? Is it sometimes struggling with foul language? Is it sometimes filled with gossip? Is it sometimes filled with lies or even with slander? Things that do not bear testimony to the fact that we've just received our Lord. Sometimes we need renewal. Sometimes we need to realize that this mouth, this instrument with which I receive the Lord, it should be renewed, it should be sanctified, it should be made holy, and it should be reserved in a special way. 
And it should also speak back out that reality that we receive, that message of hope, that message of forgiveness, that message of reconciliation, that message ultimately of joy, of receiving our Lord and our God. That when we receive the Eucharist into ourselves, what comes out should be nothing but joy, hope, and holiness. Maybe that's the way the Lord is encouraging us to celebrate the sacrifice and the covenant more clearly. Because we can't just approach this table and act as if it's just for us to gain something, and just for us to get something, get our Jesus, and go on about our day. But that should really change us, and it should define who we are. And that is what we're reminded of. Because so many times in the temporal occasions and celebrations of life, maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's a moment of mourning and a funeral, or maybe it's a graduation, or so many other countless celebrations that we can go through in our lives. We wouldn't just have the meal and then not really celebrate the occasion, but it's all about that central mystery or whatever the occasion may be. And that, in fact, is what we're reminded of in the context of this celebration of Corpus Christi, that the Lord doesn't just give us this table. He gives us his body and his blood. He renews that covenant with us so that we might enter in more deeply and be filled with greater reverence and devotion and receive the Eucharist with greater fervor and with greater joy so that it may change our entire life, our souls, and renew us in life and life everlasting. My brothers and sisters, Jesus has come, he's given over his body and his blood for us, and we enter into that sacred communion and covenant with our Lord and our God. May our hearts, our souls, and even our entire lives be renewed by the mystery of the sacrifice. The, the blood that Christ has poured out is the blood that he truly gives us, that when he gives his body and his blood, may we celebrate the Eucharist with greater fervor and devotion and truly recognize what he has given to us, the keys to eternal life.